It's okay. <coughs> so if people start to come in, try to be undisturbed, try to focus on the wisdom and the experience. Breathe and pay attention to yourself. After many, many years of experience in spirituality, we still do this. We still pay attention to ourselves. In very short time, you will be uh, used to uh, the Spanish people in the back translating. You'll just forget about that. It's okay. Some people need that translation to understand the wisdom. have been uh, trained to be evil people, sinners. We have been conditioned to believe that we are not good, <coughs> that unhappiness is what we deserve. It is a conditioning of nature. Nature wants to make sure we survive, so it makes things uh, difficult, and when they're not, uh, nature will make us believe things are difficult to ensure we survive. We have to do our best. Okay? I like the Hindu approach to uh, the following thought. We have to teach God how to create because He forgot. We have to teach God how to behave as God because He forgot. So we have to tell Brahma what to do. That's, uh, that's a very Hindu, very Hindu way, very Hindu approach. Uh, because it could be considered to be arrogant for us humans to show Brahma how to think, how to observe. When everything was created, it was created in the same way. Physical matter, emotional systems, mind, Everything was created according to the same laws. But these laws in nature, they include the concept of experimenting and difference. So we are all very different experiences. I'm not talking about every human is different. I'm, I'm saying humans are almost all the same <coughs> of a slightly aesthetical outside variance. But we're different than plants and we're different than atoms. But when we understand the fundamental laws of the creation, we understand that everything is made on exactly the same basic principles. Okay. So before we study the principles of physical nature, we have to look at ourselves as humans to see how we can discover what are these laws of nature. The Christians have a philosophy called the seven sins. I love the seven sins. I think they are blessings. Okay. So I don't always remember all of them in English, so you're going to help me. Okay. How about someone writes? Shantipo? You write? So there's... Gluttony? Seven sins. <coughs> So there's gluttony, D-O-N-Y, yes. don't put numbers because they're not in good order. Oh. Just squash out the number one, yeah. All right, we just want to have a bunch. Now keep writing, there's wrath, W-R-A-T-H, or anger, slash anger. Or maybe we go one by one. Yeah, that would be good. So, what is the use of gluttony? Okay, have a, enough food. Okay, 
as animals, as mammals in the jungle, is it useful to accumulate as much energy as possible? Yes, it is. So we were made to be gluttonous. I don't know what it means. To <laughs> gluten. <laughs> we were made with gluttony to make sure we would accumulate as as much resources as we could. Okay, so so gluttony may be seen as a sin, something evil that we are going to be killed by God, punished, and sent to hell, or at least purgatory, depending on how much money we send to church. <laughs> Uh, you can always buy your way out, you know, money rules. So, so we have gluttony, and then there's anger and wrath. As animals in nature, because of creation made with so much differences, we got to a point where intelligent or maybe sentient beings, animals and humans, people that see the outside, we see it as different. We're so far off in the energy of separation because creation is the ability to separate ourselves from God, okay? So we're so far off in the experience of separation that we see only separation and, and outside as different, as evil, as offensive, as we need to protect ourselves, we're afraid. You know, we, we have really extracted ourselves from the whole of oneness and we feel separation. So while we are stuck with that separation and someone else comes and because he has gluttony, he's going to come and take my food. <laughs> so I have to kick his butt, right? <laughs> so nature made sure I would protect my resources, my properties, my food. And talking about property, we have envy, okay? Which could also be jealousy. Yes, you get this? Envy is to make sure we have enough. It's about resources and property and management. We want to go get as much resources as we can, regardless if someone already believes they own it. We just want it, we take it. So we want what the other has. Uh, actually, we, we don't care about if the other has it, we just want it, okay? Mm -hmm. And then uh, we think if this other person has those resources, he gets strong, he can kick my butt with his wrath. So I want to have his resources, make sure that he doesn't become stronger. I want to have the, the best, powerful, shiny, glossy wrath that I can. You know. Then there's pride. Now, every system that survived has a social structure, okay? Of course, we're not talking about bacteria. We're talking about species and mammals, but there's a social structure. And even in bacteria, uh, there's something that is not social structure, but there's something about the, that pride that we're talking about. Pride is to ensure to identify our position in society. Okay? What is my place? So I try to compete to have a better esteem, a better value compared to who. And whoever dominates me, I know who rules and I know who I rule over. So that pride will make sure that everything holds together. Pride is the cement of society, of social structures, okay? Pride is absolutely essential for us to establish communications and to know how to behave when there's no compassion, when we're animals. Okay, so thanks to pride, we have a government that functions. Yes, our government functions because 4,000 years ago, our government was about raising a village and killing everyone there to get their resources and today we're so better because only a few people are at war at the same time on this planet you know we like to to brag about how bad news is and everybody's uh, so much in suffering and all the rage and all the war but there hasn't ever been in the story of mankind so little crime and so much abundance for everyone regardless there's still poverty and crime and suffering of course but we're in the best possible human situation so far, okay? So this pride made sure that someone who has pride also wants to be loved, okay? He wants to, to, to vanquish the one before and to buy off the attention of the people under him in this social structure, okay? So to buy off the love of people as humanity evolves, we got to a point where you have to make sure people love you instead of making sure 
you have more wrath than them to, to impose your will. So pride made sure also that we would be respected by our subordinates and we'll try to provide them something for us to gain because rich people cannot get rich if the poor has no money. Okay? So when the rich people make sure the poor have no money and go and die and suffer, um, everybody wants to kill everyone and they throw over the, the, the regime. There's a coup d'etat. Okay? So the rich people who stay rich for many generations are those who actually understand you have to care for the people to get more money out of their workforce. So for them to work, make sure they're strong, make sure they have enough food, so they end up being our caretakers. Okay? So pride is the caretaking system that without compassion, without understanding um, of the virtuous principles will just lead people to want to be loved to the point of killing others. Okay? So pride is extremely important, although it's a cause of suffering. It's important in nature. Okay? Then, I don't want to say the next one in order, so let's go with um, laziness. Why are we lazy? Because as animal, we need to save energy. We need to save as much energy as we can, so we just eat like crap and make sure we have the stuff of others and protect our food and then establish our social structure. And then you need to rest. You need to just lazy boy yourself out, you know, <laughs> to make sure you won't waste any kind of energy at no, any level. Okay, that's very important. Then there's cupidity. Cupidity is, of course, in our society, a sickness, but also essential. It's to accumulate as much as you can with the least effort possible because cupidity, cupid, yeah. So cupidity is to make sure to accumulate as much as you can while spending the less possible energy or resources because it also respects laziness. Okay? So to be Cupid, you're Cupid when you just want to have the next thing but you don't really want to pick your butt out of your lazy boy to go get it. So, so you ask someone, you know, one of your subordinate that you've enslaved by pride systems you know, to go and get it. <laughs> okay, so the higher pride, the higher level of cupidity, usually in nature, it works that way, okay? <laughs> and too bad for the people at the bottom of the pyramid, um, but it's still a system that made sure any kind of creature could survive. Then there's luxury. Okay, so luxury, and we have such a bad understanding of luxury. Luxury is for us to have a bit of fun and all that, you know, we need to enjoy ourselves or else we just, what's the point of being alive in nature anyway, to <coughs> kill ourselves, which is also a bit, very bad idea, I'll tell you about suicide later. Parenthesis, someone who suicides will spend 30, 50, 100 years in the state of suffering they try to avoid, okay, they stay as it goes for a long time, so don't do that. So, luxury. Now, the, the Christian misunderstanding some someone having sex is in luxury. Oh, they're so like luxurious that they're having sexuality. What? I mean, we were created by sexual um, with sexual organs uh, by God. Okay. So, do you think God made a bad job, or did He do it perfectly? You know, it depends. Do you hate your Creator that much that the funniest thing in life? would be bad, you know. <laughs> you need to hate yourself at one point to reject that. But I understand in sexuality there's also suffering. Okay? But sexuality has nothing to do with luxury. Luxury is stimulate your senses. Ah, of course you can do this with sexuality. But then you stimulate your senses with food that tastes better. And then you get into drugs and then games and entertainment and then extreme sports and you end up diving in a pool filled with acid and razor blades naked, you know, just to see how much you can have. So eventually luxury will kill you. <laughs> but we need to know, you know, extreme sports, what will they invent next time? So the seven sins, thank you. The seven sins are systems that ensure that we survive. And why are we so strong with these behaviors? It's because 
Um, we're probably the species that thrives the most on the planet. The proof is we can even kill it if, we, uh, if we're not careful. So these, since these physical behaviors, these materialist powers that we have, we're made that way. Okay. Now I have to teach you something called forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean that what you did is bad, but you need to stop suffering about it. Forgiveness is not that. You know, that you have the hypocrite forgiveness. I forgive you, but I won't forget you. No, that's not forgiveness. That's trading points. You know, the hypocrite forgiveness is you do something bad to me, but I still yearn for the resources you have, so I'll pass a sponge, you know. I'll, I still want to have fun with you, so I'll make like if you did not insult me, okay? So the hypocrite forgiveness is actually uh, pride, management of social uh, behaviors to make sure that we can still have a family. So you have to forgive your family or else you'll lose your family. So you're not forgiving, you're enduring so that you can also keep having the advantages of whoever offended you, okay? That's the hypocrite forgiveness, okay? That's false forgiveness, that's not even humble, that's, that's completely egotistical, okay? Forgiveness is a state of being, of understanding what happened really. So let's say someone offends you, he calls you an asshole. To really understand that this person is stuck with pride and wrath, and he needs to attack you in order to keep his sense of worth because he's afraid of you, okay, to lose his social structure. So if you understand why someone does it and you understand that everyone is kind of physically enslaved to these behaviors, how can you hate them, okay? Forgiveness is to have a, an authentic and honest regret. I really regret that this shit is happening to me right now. I really have a remorse that that this nature is so powerful and causes us to suffer. Okay? But when people act that way, you need to make the effort to understand why they do it. And that's why you're going to have to challenge your own pride. Forgiveness is to challenge your own pride. That's good. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <laughs> because the Quebecers understood that. <laughs> Because <laughs> when, you, when you have this pride, you don't want to forgive the other, okay? Someone steals your TV, and you think that you're attached to your TV, and it, it causes you suffering because he didn't have the right to. No, actually, you're offended in your pride. He dared steal that TV from me. You know, how dare he steal from me? That's the most offensive thing. When someone steals something from you, it's your pride. It attacks your worth as an authority in society. Do you understand? So, of course, there's the attachment. Let's say someone leaves you, okay? Your lover leaves you. Part of your suffering is pride. She or he dares do this to me, okay? And you start to dramatize how bad it was because your pride is affected, because you want to be so fucking important to everyone and you don't really care about making the others feel important instead. So that causes a friction. Maybe he left you because you're too proud. <laughs> you have to look at all these human issues in terms of we are enslaved to these behaviors and it hurts. Now, intellectually, again, another level of understanding. Sins. Why are they called sins? Okay? Well, in English, it makes no sense. Okay? But in pretty much every other language, the word sin means to fish, okay? to go fish. The, the French will know pêcher, and the Spanish will know pescado. You know? So, What, it is, what, what does that mean, to go fish? That's, it doesn't make sense. Well, someone at one point decided to use that expression to describe whatever 
this is to be evil. Okay, so we need to go back to that time and understand why they chose that word. Okay, the people of uh, let's say Israel in the, in the entire area, uh, Palestine and all that area. Um, most people spoke Aramean at that time, which is the language of Jesus. And a few elite people spoke Hebrew. Okay? The rabbis and their sons and stuff like that. Their dictionary contained about 6,800 uh, 6, words. With 600, uh, sorry, with 6,800 and so words, the word philosophy, the word materialism, the word emotion, all these words do not exist. Okay? They don't have 65,000 words like we do. They have a few thousand words, which is pretty much only the words that were used in the Bible and none other. Okay? Barely no other. Okay? And in each area, they would grow their own expressions to try to describe stuff, which in the end made every other group in the other area not perfectly understand the same language. Okay? Since it was barely written, or not written at all, these languages evolved extremely quickly. The expressions and the way to communicate were constantly changing. Okay? So since so many words are missing, well, they're not missing. They were not invented yet. Words to describe philosophical states of being, okay? or abstract states of being. So we're going to do a little exercise okay? to try to understand how these people pop their language. Read and pay attention to it. <clears throat> Deep breath and relax. And you'll close your eyes and imagine that you are water. You are water in an ocean. So your body is made of water. You need to feel. It's not just the image, the feeling of the emotion. You're water in water, eventually you dissolve. You're intangible, you're just flowing in that infinite ocean. And there's no shape of your body to grab. Breathe. Now imagine a fish in that water. It's not you, it's just something else. You're the water and there's a fish. And the fish has different feeling than water, okay? Don't think, feel. The fish has a feeling of being solid. It moves in the water. It is flexible, but it is solid. It is contained in itself. It is hard. Okay? And feel that hardness. Now imagine a very big fish. And it's like massive, like a whale. And it is a very solid thing in water, which is intangible. Okay? Breathe and come back. So now you have a feeling, okay? So when someone was in a boat getting fish out of the ocean, and we call him a fisherman, it's because he's taking fish out of the water, okay? But if we call a fisherman someone who is in a field cutting the hay, and we call him a fisherman, it is a representation, okay? It means someone that cares for the solid thing more than the intangible one, okay? It's a metaphor. And the reason why in that time they spoke with so many metaphors and parables and similes is because there were words missing from their dictionary to allow them to communicate correctly. The feelings that they had when it was not about matter. So the seven sins actually are seven fishing ways. And it refers to the materialist behaviors. To care about the amount of food, to protect yourself, to gain as much as you can, well, not, not the same stupidity, to, to want the resources of others to go and get them, to establish your social position, to save energy, to gain as much as you can without spending energy and have fun through all that, okay? So these are material, materialistic behaviors and we are made that way. So there's nothing evil in sins. 
Absolutely nothing. It simply means this is a materialist behavior, and that's it. Now, why do they call it the seven capital sins? Like if God would come to kill you if you do them. No way. It means that if you eat and you have eaten enough and you still have gluttony, you're going to eat so much, you're going to die. You're going to make yourself sick and die. And if you have nothing to protect and you stay angry, you're going to grow cancer and stuff, and you're going to die. And if you're always envious, people will not want to be with you, will protect themselves from you, you're going to be left alone. And in society, it means death. Pride. If you have established your position in society and you still have the pride, you're still always going with pride, it's going to hurt you. Laziness. Once you have saved enough energy and you keep saving energy, you keep being lazy, you're going to grow weak and die. And cupidity will have something like this. We'll just You'll spend as little uh, energy as possible and gather so much. At one point, you'll be overwhelmed with the amount of stuff you've gathered and it'll crush you. Okay? And luxury, once you have enough entertainment and you keep stimulating yourself, you're going to go in additions and stuff that will eventually kill you. So capital sins does not mean that you're doing something evil and God will come to kill you as a punishment. No, it means it's a materialist behavior that will eventually cause your death because it's planned that way by nature. Okay. You understand this? Breathe. I want you to understand that you're a good person and that each time you did something in this, that was explained to you that you were evil, you were just doing exactly what God had in mind for you. You were acting in a way that God created you to act. So you, you were raised with a mind that despises the creation of God. You're raised to believe that you're evil. Okay? But you're made that way by that God. Okay? By the divine concept. So some Buddhists don't believe in God. Okay, I give it to you. Uh, you were made that way by the universe, by Om, by whatever happened for creation to exist. Okay. And I know, you know, Buddha speaks of Brahma, creator of all things, but then the Buddhists say the Bu that there is no God. But actually, the Buddha sometimes spoke about God and address him in prayers. Anyway, also spoke of Shiva and Vishnu often, but. You know, these are very wisdom. In any case, you were trained to think that you are a worthless piece of crap. And actually, you were created perfectly by God. And that's a challenge inside. Okay? Because it causes us to, to misunderstand how we are made. Right? Forgiveness is to understand so that there's no more offense. Someone steals your TV, uh, I understand this person is stupid. He wants to uh, gain resources without working for it. Well, he pretty, maybe he worked pretty hard to get into your house anyway. <laughs> you get this? Okay. <coughs> Intellectually, it makes sense, but then we have emotions. We have stuff. We might know this intellectually. You're still going to go home if we don't go further, thinking you're a piece of crap and you deserve the evil that happens and evil is done unto you, so it's hard to forgive and all this stuff. We need to do something more. So we'll proceed to the next step. Yes? Some people probably don't use the word cupidity. Could you pick Greed. Cupidity is greed. I could blow some hot air and say cupidity is the more refined word. Actually, it's, it's a copy of the French. And I forgot about Greek. <laughs> okay, thank you. We will do emotional stretching. <clears throat> and for some of you who know what is emotional stretching, we will intentionally go and feel like crap and then intentionally go feel very happy to become more flexible of the level of the heart. Okay, so. These sins, these behaviors, these natural behaviors we're built with in our flesh were made that way 
And we acted that way and people hated us because when we were doing the seven sins, they were in their wrath or their pride or their energy to go tell you that, they're, that you're evil. Actually, they were doing exactly the same thing, which caused conflicts. You know, who is the one that tells the other that they're wrong while it is that same energy that pushes them to tell them that? Okay, what you did is wrong and what pushes them to tell you it's wrong is the same energy that pushes you, that pushed you to do whatever you did that was wrong. All of this is the conflict of separation in nature, what makes us perceive each other as individual and separated and so isolated and eventually abandoned and rejected and we feel guilty constantly because everything we do can be declared to be evil in the eyes of someone who wants to believe that. I want you to pick a moment of shame in the last few weeks or in your teenagers a moment of shame that you remember and I want you to go and sink in that shame pick a hard thing pick something you hate yourself for all right don't be afraid to go juicy on that one okay So there's a shame. You did something wrong. You desired someone sexually and you were rejected. You felt shame. You actually acted on it. You were told that you were wrong. You felt shame. You stole something. Maybe you said words. Maybe you left your family. You did something that you feel shame. So go and sink. And breathe slowly and deeply. When doing integration, if you breathe too fast, <gasps> but I want to feel it more, <sighs> you're just going to hyperventilate. Okay? Just go breathe deeply and give time to emotion to invade you. <sighs> Maybe God wanted to love you and you rejected Him. It takes a bit of courage, I know, but you need to know how to go in that state. And in shame there is guilt. If you feel guilt, breathe. At one point, you will reach the existential shame that you have for no reason. A shame simply of being ashamed. A shame simply because you feel ashamed. The fundamental existential shame does not require you to do something evil. We all have it. We believe that we are worthless. Because to exist here, we had to leave home. We had to be separated from our soul, from God. So go there. When you're convinced that everything you do is wrong, existential guilt, existential shame. And breathe. Nature made sure to push you always beyond your limits. Made sure that you still feel inadequate so that you will thrive and go further. So somewhere inside you, there's this belief that you can never be correct. This is the ego's misunderstanding of the will of God. The will of God is a feeling inside that we must continue until we find oneness again. That we must continue until we, tr we, we find great bliss again. Until we vanquish the power separation. God made sure that we will be motivated, we'll, we will be driven by a force 
always feel inaccurate, inappropriate, unworthy until we have rejoined back. So we have this fundamental guilt of existing because we separated ourselves from the oneness. So go in there. The shame, the guilt, and you breathe. Ultimately, we feel crap because we voluntarily, intentionally cut ourselves away from God, from love. And then you have other humans around you that want to love you and you push it away because of human systems, because of your belief, because you're feeling guilty for your sins, because you're a bad person. How can you find happiness if you're convinced you must feel like crap? So it takes a while for this emotion to be resolved, but at least now you know about it. Because we took a few minutes to sink in there. The fundamental shame of existing, the guilt that drives us. Breathe. Now we're getting to release stuff because you paid attention to the experience. <coughs> Part of it was released. So we'll do a releasing out breath. And I want to hear the sound like this. <sighs> Everyone. Okay. One another, okay. <sighs> All right. Doing the little sound, it kind of releases us. It's a breath that uses all the integration we just did to release the pressure, it makes us feel a bit better. And whatever we've been working on, we're starting to go in conscious repressal, okay? We're gonna willingly repress whatever is left to resolve. We have another year or 10 or 100 to resolve our issues. We resolve stuff. Now we have to take care of another matter, so. Ah. Ooh. All right, thank you. Now you keep your eyes closed and you imagine that every cell of your body is a happy face. And you breathe happy, happy, so happy. My life is so simple, I am so happy. And the happy face is everywhere and that joy and you're tingling all over and the joy is happy faces streaming through your veins, through your blood vessels and happiness moves in you with great gladness and we're gonna enjoy that one too <sighs> release that pressure <sighs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, how do you feel about that one? Feel good? Feel relaxed, Vidya? <laughs> Happy? Huh? Everyone make a little stupid smile. <laughs> All right. <laughs> is understanding the experience. And right now, you can start to go in that state of forgiveness because we explain that you are created with natural forces that push you towards your suffering because it also pushes you towards survival. But once your survival is ensured, to stay enslaved to those forces will just kill you. Make your mind go crazy and hate each other. Do you understand this? This hatred that grabs us. Now, I just, I just fooled you a bit, those who didn't know. Did you notice by paying attention to the happy faces you were happy? Okay, so sometimes you're sad because you pay attention to it. Okay, your drama is amplified by you looking at it with the uh, denial perspective. You look at it without doing integration, so you're just amplifying your suffering, okay? If you look at happiness for no reason, boom, you're happy. 
if you take the time, of course, some people are very depressed, have difficulty, it takes a lot of time. But for most of you here, you've done integration in the past, you have an idea how to feel stuff. So it works, okay? It does, all right? Suffering is real. Drama is an illusion. Your drama does not exist. If your father left the family, the children feel abandoned and the wife will feel abandoned. Okay? Understand this? But if the father suicided, the father took his own life. <clears throat> we use another drama to amplify it. It's even worse. But what if he would have died out of a sickness? Well, you know, stuff happens. If he dies of old age, it's less dramatic. Because it was planned, it happened, we accept it. So, if the father died in an accident, uh, unexpected illness, old age, took his life, or just went away with another girl. Your emotion is absolutely identical. There was something there, it's gone, I feel about it. Everything that happens in the scenario to explain how it happened is bullshit drama that you use to amplify your suffering because you need to attract the attention of those who have pride above you in the social system to make sure you stay functional. Okay? So that the proud people decide to help you out instead of persecute you, you need to become a victim for them to adapt to the savior model and you know that's how it works in nature. Okay? So drama is when you pay attention to a suffering not wanting to be conscious of the suffering. Drama builds up. You amplify your pain. You want to make it worse so that it will have more value to the society, to the rest of us. Okay? So drama does not exist. Your suffering is real. Don't say, oh, I'm not suffering. You know, it doesn't matter if he left or if he took his life or if he died of a sickness. It doesn't matter how it happened. But this father or mother that you loved, this lover, this friend, this child, or the job, or your new car, something I had and it's gone. It leaves some kind of vacuum and that's the emotion of abandonment. You understand this? So the time we take to gaze at our suffering, not wanting to understand it, we amplify the suffering and we build our wall. We just plaster more cement on the bricks to make sure the wall holds stronger. Okay? And while we suffer consciously, it will be the same suffering, but we will be dissolving the plaster that holds the bricks, the cement. We'll be taking it off brick by brick to free ourselves. Okay? So drama is a way that our intellect, our emotions, and our body, our human definitions, our human system, they try to understand the situation without experience, without the knowledge of it. Okay, what's, what is the difference between wisdom and knowledge? Knowledge is to know that the oven, uh, what's, what's the name of it? The iron is hot, and wisdom is to know how to not put your hand on it. Okay, so knowledge is this is hot, wisdom is don't touch it. Okay. Knowledge is about the facts, information, and we're trying, we're trying to get the facts, but we can't. Why did he leave? Okay, we're trying to understand. We get into this sickness because trying to understand prevents us from <coughs> resolving the fact, I feel abandoned. Because something left. Maybe it's not something that left, but something that pushed us away. Now it will be rejection. Okay? Or maybe something, a parent, a child, a, a lover, a job, friends, society as a whole will just tell you that you're bad so it will be a guilt that you you feel okay but trying to understand why did he say this why did he do this why did this happen this entire why thing we will not 
understand it because we're trying to project outside and it nurtures the outside separate from the inside okay so it's cool to understand it's very wise to want to understand what happened the priority is how do you feel and how much you're stuck with that suffering and you have to go and do that integration and then you can look at the facts and you can forgive because forgiveness is understanding why did father leave luxury is it well maybe he felt so much crap because your mother is a bitch and you don't want to admit it because it's the only mother you know and you wouldn't dare you know take your mother's the cause of the father leaving maybe your father is so in luxury that he's addicted to more stimulation and your mother doesn't provide the stimulation anymore and he went to stimulate himself in another fashion okay how about cupidity he wanted something more whatever the reason there's something inside him that caused it to do of course it's irresponsible most of the time not always we can't have rules but most of the times a father that doesn't want to take care of his family it's not planned the rules of nature because in nature usually the, the people want to care for the children but you know shit happens so forgiveness is understanding that what you hate the most is not your father it is the suffering that happened when your father left when your lover left when your child left or when the job threw you away or when your car broke or stuff like that so what you are angry at is not the drama it is the suffering the drama does not exist but we just project outside we know we, you know we go to uh, to conquest we we want to uh, to do a crusade to prove everything is wrong around us but we're okay because of that pride to make sure we don't look at ourselves but others to establish a better position I cannot have done that evil I cannot suffer because I need to be stronger you know establish uh, a position in society so we have a very complex ego that that wants to justify the suffering instead of understanding it forgiveness is understanding the suffering so that we can grow from it okay that's the introduction next step we will review the 21 masks of the ego one after the other it will be fun break time